It is my sincere pleasure to welcome you all to this Paley Dialogue Breakfast, a conversation between Kristen Dolan, the Chief Operating Officer of Cablevision Systems Corporation, and our very own Paley trustee, Josh Sapin, President and CEO of AMC Networks. Um, you have in your handouts bios describing both Kristen and Joss's illustrious careers. So rather than enumerating all of their tremendous success, I just want to say how excited and appreciative I am to have them both here together with us this morning and also at this particular moment in time. So what a time it is in the rapidly evolving world of cable operators in the larger arena of what's now called content distribution. What to call, how to define, and how to succeed in the cable TV business segment has changed dramatically just in the last few years, let alone over the course of Kristen and Josh's careers. We were, we're very much looking forward to hearing their respected um, views on what's changed most and how the cable industry generally has changed, and, and more specifically, how Cablevision has changed and what they're doing to reposition themselves for what lies ahead. For all of us here at the Paley Center, bringing you this thoughtful and dynamic duo today is a timely chance to do what we do best, engage all of you gathered here to help better understand the media's present, strategize for the future, and all within the context of what has come before. Before we get underway, I'd just like to recognize some Paley trustees that are in attendance with us this morning, Kay Koplovitz and Stan Schumann. Thank you so much for being with us this morning. We also extend our sincerest thanks to our long-term and valued partner, McKinsey, who serves as our official knowledge partner. I'd also like to welcome all of our members of the Paley Media Council and their invited guests. For those of you who aren't yet members but are interested in attending more very special events like these, I'd like to invite you to see Diane Lewis, who's over there in the corner after the breakfast this morning. And now, without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce you all and welcome Joss and Kristen to the stage. Thanks so much. Uh, Kristen, if you don't know, has been really at 25 years at all sides of our world, on the content side, the distribution side, the brand side, the marketing side, the digital media side, and very importantly, the advertising side, and actually has a wealth of knowledge and has accomplished a whole ton of stuff along the way in 25 years. So hopefully we'll get some of that insight and apply some of it to what's happening uh, today. So I'll start off, if I may, I'll sort of rewind the clock a little bit because it's curious and maybe it sheds some light on things that are occurring today with OTT and other things. Um, uh, what it's like to have been through all these changes, including analog to digital, you were at Rainbow, predecessor to AMC in the 90s when AMC, if my numbers are right, had I think 12 or 14 million subscribers. It was sort of a glint in the eye of the Dolans of what it could become. Um, and so do you mind going back and talking about what it was like? Sure. So we talked about this a little bit in our prep, just about how different the industry is now from when I started. So I started right out of grad school, and I got the exciting opportunity to be an affiliate sales rep and affiliate marketing rep um, covering territory from Maine basically down to Virginia. And so my job was to go out was decentralized at the time, so Kay will remember this for sure, and Matt Blank, um, just how many cable systems there were to go from you know all these brands that are, or companies that you don't even hear of anymore, Cablevision Industries and um, Dimension Cable and Continental Cable and Cablevision Industries, and so there were just dozens and dozens and dozens of accounts that we would visit. But at the time, you could actually go, we'd usually go to Olive Garden, um, and you could you could actually close a deal yourself with a handshake. Was it, it was always an Olive Garden. Usually, yes. Well, it's Pennsylvania. Wawa's, you know. I've been, you know, people would say you want to come up and see my head end, which was not a euphemism. Um, it really was. <laughs> Um, so you would go and you could do a deal on a handshake, which is dramatically different than now. You basically you go to Philadelphia, you go to Atlanta, or you come to New York, and those pretty much that's where the deals get done. So very different, but great opportunity for me to learn the cable system inside and out because once we got them to carry either AMC or Bravo at the time, or eventually um, Romance Classics, which became WeTV. Then we had to go in and actually train um, the local people about what the network was because back then there weren't enough channels to really fill the dial. So people were anxious to get content. We would sell the content in, and then you would go up and 
was 24 years old standing in front of a room of field service technicians <laughs> telling them about you know classic movies, which was fun. And so, and so how different was the cable system of then to the cable system of today? Very, so mostly one way, 350 megahertz. You know, if you're lucky, you had a couple channels of pay-per-view coming downstream. Um, no broadband, obviously, no telephone. Um, very different, no on-demand. And, and the customer experience back then versus the customer interface today? Yes, yeah, so no UI. There's, for those of you that are young in the room, no remote control. That there was sort of the <laughs> button, the box with the buttons on it that had a long cord that came out. But, you know, different, what we're trying to recreate today is when the cable truck came down the street, people were excited. And so, you know, I know we're yeah. going to talk a little bit about yeah. brand later, but yes. just what what it means to have a, try and create a brand again. You know, people love broadband. They have such an affinity for, you know, for the internet and connectivity. And so that's, I think, reinvigorated um, just the whole concept of, of television and why you should get excited about cable yes. as a product, because it's no longer a single product environment. So, so about brand, just because you, you mentioned the word brand. Mm -hmm. And there are a number of people in the room who are uh, brand experts. And so we're, we're speaking to authorities we should remember. Um, <laughs> But a lot of your experience at AMC Fuse, MSG, Cablevision was about brand, and you just mentioned it, and notably, Cablevision is known to many consumers as Optimum, right. not Cablevision, which when it occurred, I must say, I thought, what's that? You can't tell people it's called that when it's this. But it certainly seemed successful, so how important is brand today, and how has brand loyalty in the media world changed? Mm -hmm. That's a, a great question. So we, um, four years ago, we embarked upon just sort of reimagining the company and revisiting everything that we were doing as like a traditional, I and mean, one of the things that we felt really strongly about was that the brand was not particularly friendly, not particularly approachable, and it sort of represented the old guard of our industry. It was black and white and red, and you know, if you think about some of the other um, telecom brands, just very aggressive all capitals, you know, big giant O for Optimum. And, and um, we did a lot of studies, and people, as with most cable companies, if you look at net promoter scores as a category, you know, telecom is usually really low. And um, we wanted to just reimagine and put ourselves in a different category. So we did a ton of research, ethnographic, and demo, you know, every kind of research you can think of, and went into customers' homes and talked to them a lot about what they liked about the brand, which at the time wasn't that much, and what the opportunities were to, to reimagine it. And we went from sort of these very staid kind of but aggressive um, primary colors into this whole other approach that's much more um, transparent and friendly and happy and lowercase. And just um, we went to the extent of actually spending a lot of time and money to rebrand all of our trucks and to embrace this really beautiful color palette and an, an entirely different approach that feels more um, compelling to customers and, and has shown, it's actually proven now to have, they have a much stronger affinity for the brand because we reimagined not only the, the presentation of the brand, but we redid the products and the service equation and, and tried to reimagine and, and encourage people to have stronger value perceptions. And so by doing everything at once and then presenting them with something, you know, that they could feel positively about, um, it went really well. So do you think, <clears throat> if, we, if we rewind, if you don't mind, sort of 15, 20 years ago, and the brands were limited, mm -hmm. right? Choices were limited, and then today, the, the choices and brands are abundant, and shows have come into the mix on our side right. of the world. Does brand become more important and essential to success, <coughs> or do you sort of have to give it up a bit and just go with where consumer desire moves? You so and I'll answer that, and then I want to ask you a question. So, um, <laughs> I'm not, <laughs> actually, I'm mind. not available. I think, at the moment. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to speak to representatives. I think some of them are in the room. So the <laughs> the thing for us with brand also is we're in a very competitive environment. We have to have a brand that people like because not dissimilar to Apple. I'm not saying we're Apple, but. People are willing to pay more, and they're comfortable paying more if they feel like they're getting a good quality of experience. And so for us, the brand helps differentiate what arguably is a commoditized product, right? TV, phone, internet. But the service equation, I think, brings it up to a different level. And then having, like I said, a brand that's approachable and interesting adds to that. So don't speak. No, dip, 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 dip. <laughs> 
do you think, <laughs> do you think as a network, right, so AMC in particular, right, you can't look at zombies, you can't think about, you know, meth addicts or things like that without thinking about your network. How does the brand <clears throat> for your networks, in a sort of speaking of commoditization, as like programs are commoditized because people sell them across different platforms and they present them outside the mothership of yeah. the brand. Like how does how do you manage that? Like preserving the brand and things that is, are associated with AMC or Sundance or IFC while still sort of maximizing your opportunity for, for viewership. Right. Well we think we own on AMC uh, any man's descent into absolute despair <laughs> through infidelity, methadrine, uh, or uh, anything apocalyptic. <laughs> no one does that like we do it. So we hope to mistake when other people do it well. Matt's here. If, if Paul Giamatti looks like he's descending into despair on billions, they'll confuse that and think that's an AMC show. So um, you know, it's a really interesting question uh, because um, shows uh, have become, uh, sort of, I think, more dominant in people's minds than mm -hmm. channels. And I think, if I were to say it idiomatically, I think people sort of want their show. And they're accessible much more rapidly with interfaces on uh, cable systems and on-demand platforms, mm -hmm. so I think the place that houses them becomes to some degree at risk, just as you said. So does it matter that uh, Better Call Saul is on AMC or does Better Call Saul just predominate? Right. And <clears throat> I think, I guess I would express it as a challenge <laughs> as I think about it, which is to, um, to take the strength of the show and, and the draft behind it, which is essential because I don't think people want to say, I love the Sundance channel. It's not of first interest to them. They may, there's someone in the room who loves a show called Rectify. I won't ask him to stand up and be counted. Um, <laughs> but he's a very important We've person. Counted them. <laughs> and he loves a show called Rectify. Some of you don't know it, so I, I'm, a, I'm just doing a minor commercial for Rectify and Sundance. But in all seriousness, so I think the challenge becomes how to take the draft of interest in the show mm -hmm. and make sure the brand, the channel, because that's our business, gets the attribution. It's a bit of a delicate balancing act. You said you'd ask and I'll answer in 23 minutes. Um, yeah. But in all seriousness, Kristen, it's so interesting because if you look at the advertising for billions or for um, FX's new OJ show or for vinyl or for Fear the Walking Dead, you actually won't, you don't really even notice that much mm -hmm. the name of the channel. You see the show. So the channel brand. Right. And the number, right? So channel position no longer matters. Right. And so then the question is, so how do you draft off that? Mm -hmm. And I think the answer is you, you do everything you can without getting in the way of the momentum of the show to make sure that the world knows, forgive my back to everybody, that it's on AMC, it's on Sundance, it's on BBC America, it's on WeTV, which means that you take every subtle, sometimes uh, intrusive, but hopefully not intrusive in the way that the consumer notices, yep. opportunity to attach it to yourself. And th th that's, it's a fair amount of work, you know, it's granular, but I think it's really very important. Good answer. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> not bad, <It's> just one. <laughs> So, hey, can I ask you one? The thing I was going to spit out uh, um, about brand is, so you have kids around who are of all ages. Yep. Young, teen, 20s, very young. And so w what do you think of how they experience oh, brands, yes. if at all? Because actually I do too, but I'm not even sure. I'll quote one, the, the, late, the late David Carr, I was in a conversation, he said to me, uh, kids, meaning grown kids, they know everything and they don't know where anything came from. <laughs> you know, he was sort of saying like, it's just they got it. And you say, where'd you see that? I don't know. <laughs> so, but what do you think about that? Because uh, there is a new generation, yeah. changing generation. So we have from 29 years old to six years old in our house. And well, they don't live with us anymore. But the six year old, this is one hand behind the iPad and this hand's ready to hit 
fast forward through the commercial as soon as they get to the ad skip, right? And they're just watching the same videos over and over on YouTube. Um, whereas the 20 somethings, anytime we travel anywhere, they all have a backpack with an Xbox in it because their games are on it, their Netflix is on it, their Apple TV is on it, their Showtime on demand, whatever it is. So they cat, which is interesting to us, it's right? They're actually they bring the Xbox because now that it's all on, it's a drive, right? So you can store your progress in the cloud, but anything you buy, you have to download onto the actual, onto the memory on the, within the unit. So they download all their games and then they each bring an individual one so they can play against each other. So really, it's about broadband, right? And yeah. Cablevision has taken a, a somewhat unique approach in the industry where we welcome anything that's gonna hang off the network. I don't care if you watch Netflix, Hulu, YouTube, whatever. We will provide the connectivity for you to do that and we've been pretty vocal in saying that's a much better margin business. Is that what you think about? Is it um, all things connected to broadband and <laughs> If you think about that, which it sounds like you do. Mm -hmm. as and service. Those are like the two critical pieces. right? So big fat pipe and then somebody that when things don't work that can come to your house and, and in, you know, I may overstate it, but in an elegant way in a purple truck um, come <laughs> and really make sure it works well. Like because you, who wouldn't pay, you know, you think of Geek Squad and some of these other high-end Magnolia, whatever. People will pay a crap load, excuse me, yeah, eating yeah, yeah. breakfast of money to make sure everything works together well because when it doesn't, it's like, you know, it's losing oxygen at this point for some people if they can't, either for work reasons or their kids or what you have to be connected. And so there's not a real good place to go um, to have people do that and, and make it work for you. And, and it's interesting, we get on this rant a little bit um, every year after coming back from Consumer Electronics Show because everything is wi is Wi-Fi and connectivity products when you go to CES. It's yeah. just like, oh, you know, we're going to do this in your car and your refrigerator and everything's going to talk to each other. And when we go to Google or Apple and we talk to them, I'm like, but you guys don't care how it gets. Like, you just assume it's just going to get there and there's nobody that's really managing that end state for them and they don't think about it. They're just like, we're going to put stuff out there and somebody else will figure out or they don't even think. You know, but there has there is that last mile sort of equation where if yeah. it doesn't all work together and there's nobody that you can reliably call to make sure that you know the TV and the refrigerator and everything talks to each other the right way, they, none of it matters, right? If it doesn't work, it's just frustration on a variety of levels. So, so you mentioned two things uh, just now as being predominant: service and broadband. If I took it mm -hmm. capacity, yep. but you you didn't say. So I want to ask about. Uh, interface and sort of environment because a lot of people say that's profound yes. and determinant, whatever the right word is, of affection and success. Mm -hmm. So UI is huge as well. Um, I think the great thing <coughs> on that front is just as IPTV comes along um, and the ability. So the challenge has always been with the set-top box, right? You're hampered by or you're hamstrung by what um, what you need to program in order to facilitate a good UI on there, because most of them are closed systems, right? So, so what does that mean? For, like, the, for those like of us in the room who don't understand, person who doesn't that. know the difference between a router and a modem. <laughs> Where is that person? I don't see him. <laughs> so back, all right. Think about computers like that had to be programmed in DOS. Yes. You know, it wasn't an app or a program that you just. So that didn't said, help. So start again. <laughs> There is a language. <laughs> so in the television set-top box, there's millions of lines of code, and yep. that's a proprietary language yep. in the old days. So if you wanted to change anything, like I you know, am very interested in language, and sometimes the hard code things, and there's like errant gr um, grammatical things on the set-top box that drive me crazy, where it'll say like, thank you, comma, please wait. And I'm like, it's not a comma. It's either a semicolon or a period. <laughs> and they're like, we can't fix that. That's hard-coded. So for the last 15 years, every time I do anything, I get annoyed. But now with IP video, right, it's more like a website. So they're moving towards HTML, which is a pro an open source programming language, right? So if we want to create a new UI, I can now go all over the world to anybody that can code in HTML5 and say, this is the design, this is the style guide, can you build this for me? And they can, and they can upgrade it easily. And then the boxes, you know, sort of operating through IP have much more power, so it's much more like a computer. So the opportunity when you see, you look at Netflix, right, and they have a beautiful UI, and Hulu has a beautiful UI, and a lot of the on-demand services have a beautiful user interface because they have the ability to present it like a website as opposed to being stuck in, you know, sort of yes. a million lines of code in a box that, you know, the software is many 
year is outdated. So the translation of that in terms of consumer experience is that is that voice, I'll just ask, is it voice recognition and fluidity of movement and algorithms that tell you what you might want mm -hmm. based on what you did and separate individual patterns. So if it says uh, you're on the, uh, you want this, are coming soon or w yep. are, are facilitated by all that. Yeah. Right. See, I think the key thing that you go for that we try to go is relevancy, right? So if you can do, for example, example, a fully integrated search, right? So I'm looking, it's a bad example, but it's, you'll see why I'm using it. I'm looking for law and order, right? I have Netflix, I have Hulu, I have USA Network, I have A&E, I have um, Fox, right? So those are all the things that I participate in as a consumer. So wouldn't it be much better to have a fully integrated search result that says you recorded five episodes, you can watch this for free on Netflix if you want to buy the Law & Order movie on paper. So it, it gives you fully integrated results and then that's coupled with recommendation engines and all the other stuff that is intelligent about, about your experience that we can aggregate into giving you results that are relevant as opposed to just I'm going to give you something in numerical order or in pre versus paid or in a category. It's like having the ability to be flexible and provide people quick information. Because um, there's times you know what you're looking for, yeah, right? Yeah, I yeah. want to watch The Martian. It just came out. I'm going to search for that. But there's other times where it's like, you know, I'm thinking something along the lines of this. So I like this show. Is there something so, so, similar? So the f because I've only seen that, at least I think, on fan TV mm -hmm. where you go uh, sort of say, Tell me where everything. Well, AMC owns some of Fan TV. We own something else, not so Fan. Much. Oh, you're promoting a competitor. Yeah, <laughs> um, but so, but that the, all that facility will come because that's not in, in any way common on right. what we call. Otherwise, you just sit. There. I don't know if you guys, but it's like, and then an hour passes, and you're like, I never found anything to watch, and I'm done. Because it's just, it's not relevant. It's just stuff. It's like an onslaught of stuff. Yeah. So, 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 open source, as you refer to it, will result in that better, more nimble, and yeah. hopefully more relevant. But interesting. So, this is maybe a good segue to one of the other things we wanted to talk about. What percentage of TV viewing do you think is live at this point? Or is it 90, so it's ninety-two percent. So, what does that mean? Um, that means people still watch a ton of stuff, and so if you can make it relevant and they can find it, they're going to continue to watch more. So, it's nine hours a day on average, something like 254 hours a month or something like that. And then you have all the time, shift, time shifted viewing on top of that. So average household, 25 channels, nine hours a day. Does that, does that surprise you? Does it make you think, because if you watch your kids, right. I'll ask you a question, or in the audience, if you, if you have kids around, how much live TV do kids you see watch? Like you're six to 29. Mm -hmm. How much live television are they watching? Yeah, it's they watch sports. They do appointment television for things, honestly, like the Breaking Bad premiere or certain shows. You know, Game of Thrones is big as well. But I think it's it's household composition, right? So you see that behavior in the kids. Um, but if they're watching something on broadband, that doesn't count against your calculation. If it has to be coming through the television, right, so right, right. of everything that's fed through the television, 92% of it is live, and we measure it, which you know, right? So that was our other topic. Yeah, can we talk about that? Um, just because um, I have my questions for you. So but talk about measuring it. Do you mind? Because it's it's so interesting. So so cable vision, because we've had I've had. A little bit of exposure to it has seven million. And we have a Rectify example for those of you in the back. <laughs> we'll get to it. The, the Rectify fan. So, in all seriousness, so Cablevision has seven million boxes yep. that provide granular data on who's doing what when mm -hmm. in real time. In personally unidentifiable <laughs> PPI compliant, PII right. compliant. Right. So what we do is we have, as you said, over 7 million set-top boxes, and we monitor in a humongous database um, every single channel tune, every single time anybody does anything 24-7, 365. And so, 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 so that's pretty unique. Right. So when we do, when we, when you ask us, for example, so this is the case study, right, Josh was, premiering a new season of Rectify. 
And when they went to Nielsen um, to see who had watched the show the previous year, the way Nielsen monitors is they do, um, they have people meters, right? So they're a representative sample in the footprint. So there used to be 300 of them in New York, and now they've upped it to about 500. So up until recently, they didn't even have enough people meters to measure every channel that people could be watching, whereas we monitor every single channel, again, not identifiable to a household, just an aggregate. So we know exactly how many people are watching everything. So we were talking to you guys, and we said, well, we can identify 350,000 people that watched the last season of Rectify because we have it stored. So we did a test where um, you did your normal advertising campaign against you know, a group of people based on the Nielsen sample, and then we did a separate campaign, a tuning campaign, against the 350,000 that we knew had watched the previous season. And so the punchline is that the tune-in for the second season was 14% higher on the people that we targeted with an addressable ad to say, you like this show, you should watch this one. And so taking sort of real, yeah. the real numbers and finding the real people the and real using humans. that and then overlaying on top of that the ability to send a specific ad to a specific type of person makes the advertising that much more valuable. Right. So there's those two components. So what are the implications of all that? It really, it really, really is sort of there's huge, radical right. to think 7 million versus 500. Versus a limited number and you know who they are with the constraints according to whatever the yeah. limitations are and addressable advertising. So what are the implications of all that from it's a- It's huge. I mean, the pay, I don't know if people saw yesterday with ESPN, the whole, um, you know, the restating yeah. of the viewership numbers, right? So uh, the, the drama this Do you mind summer- Do you mind to talk about it? Because actually so, I was consumed with uh, Iowa caucuses. Iowa, yes, you're up late. <laughs> so and the coin I might get this wrong, so that any of the smarter people in the room correct me. So over the summer, everybody saw the big stock issue, right? Because viewership was down dramatically for ESPN, and that caused like a big, you know, big craziness for Disney and everybody over the course of the summer. And what came out yesterday was um, Nielsen, they subtracted any broadband only homes from the denominator of the equation. And basically, what they said yesterday is instead of by taking out the, the group of people that couldn't have watched ESPN anyway, it turned out that the, the decline in viewership wasn't the 4.5 million that they had stated, it was actually 1.3 million. So, because they were extrapolating I as see. opposed to actually counting, right. and then they were including in the denominator people who never had the opportunity to watch television on ESPN because they didn't have subscribe to it. it, it grossly overstated the decline in subscribers. And we all saw what happened um, over the course of the summer. So that was corrected. It was in the paper yesterday. Um, but you know, in any case, like census level, being able to measure actual things as opposed to taking a model and extrapolating behaviors, you know, you look like this, therefore, it, it's just, it's pretty straightforward, right? Yeah, well, it's pretty interesting when you couple it with, uh, <laughs> with targeted advertising yeah, that's that is available in sort of real time. Mm -hmm. It seems like it's profound. Okay, so the ability to also, because we monitor all the long tail content, we can sell people advertising against a channel that they might never have considered and then be able to prove to them that instead of throwing everything against the wall, you know, to see what sticks, to advertise, you know, to take it to the extreme at the Super Bowl halftime show when you could actually be advertising on, you know, the nth MTV channel because the target that you're looking for actually does view that channel. Um, or it's something like our local news, News 12 or New York One, huge, disproportionately large amount of viewership, but those aren't measured by Nielsen. So people don't necessarily think that they would advertise there. And the cost, so the CPM is lower on the long tail networks. The um, amount of inventory increases dramatically if you include every channel you can insert on. And then, um, you know, we can sell more. So we have more inventory because addressable, you can put a different ad in the same slot for different people. So you've exponentially increased the size of your inventory. It's more valuable and you can sell on more channels. So it has interesting, just very narrowly, it has interesting implications for smaller cable TV channels if the data was yeah, found definitely. because they would be found to be truly of impact right. for particular things and cost efficient. And if you, you know, if you have a, a specific brand or a specific behavior that you're trying to push, like the, our ad sales people in the room, but you know, things like Porsche, like super high-end brands, or a specific, um, so we get down to micro too, right? Because we can insert, we have hundreds of ad zones across the footprint. So 
Our, we always have these fun categories. It used to be sleep apnea dentists who wanted to advertise, but now it's riding schools, like for people that sleep horseback. Sleep apnea dentists? Yeah, really? there's like a whole now thing with dentists who treat people with sleep apnea, and so they want to do advertising. But, you know, in the past, you'd have to buy the whole footprint. And because New York is a very interesting Place, so what do they buy now? The sleep so they can buy a little. <laughs> They're buying shopping networks. You want me? I can get you a referral. I'm, I'm just curious. As to, if I were, a, if I were the media agency for a sleep apnea dentist, I actually don't even have an instinct as to what I would well, buy. You can buy very local advertising, and then because creative, you know, creation of media, you know, to create an ad now, you can do it on, an, you know, yeah. on a PC or whatever. You can spend, you know, under twenty thousand dollars, <coughs> have decent creative, and right. then. You know, buy a media schedule that's targeted and local. Uh, on on the question of where people are watching, and uh, I actually was struck by carrying the Xbox yeah. remotely, oh, yeah. which I hadn't actually encountered. Um, Has anyone else seen that? Is it just me? Because they take them everywhere. Yeah, they take them everywhere. It's really hard. <laughs> um, so, just if you don't mind, on the uh, on sort of consumption patterns young people and what you said about broadband penetration, <laughs> open interface, mm -hmm. and the fact Not that good. TV, I actually often wonder now when people say, I saw it on TV, do right. they mean it was on a TV channel or do they mean that they actually saw it on a television screen fixed and mounted in their living room? Mm -hmm. I actually don't even know what the word means because so much viewing is occurring on phones and tablets yep. and the like. And, and then one other thing struck me, because I wasn't aware of it. <coughs> um, VOD, mm -hmm. was I had it written down, 30,000 hours. Right, so we have, th we have 30,000 titles of VOD, right? And then we record, so we have uh, DVR in the cloud, so we record everything at the cable system, not on a little hard drive in your house. And so we record now about 30 million hours a month of, um, of DVR content and people play back, I think it's 39 million hours, so they'll have a whole library of stuff, but that's on a monthly basis. They play back 39 million hours? A month, against three million customers, so it's a lot of viewing that way, plus the nine hours a day of live. People sit around and watch a lot of stuff. <laughs> but the mobile piece, you know, again, for us, like most Netflix, it's, you know, and Netflix will say this too, most Netflix subscribers have a traditional cable subscription as well, right? And so we actually went out, we have these cord cutter packages that we sell um, in the footprint where it's, you, we'll give you a digital antenna because in this market, if you live within 30 miles of the Empire State Building, you can get as many as 70 channels over the air, high definition channels over the air with an antenna. So we give you that and then we'll give you, you know, a broadband subscription and we sell Hulu, we sell, C we're selling CBS over the top, HBO to go over the top. Um, so we sell these packages for people because they are, it, it's a, so you have both ends of the spectrum. We have younger, urban, multicultural. They move a lot. They're not home a lot. They want, you know, they want broadband and they want Wi-Fi, which we do really well as well. So that's an entirely different situation than a family with young kids where they, they do need the traditional television subscription. So our goal is to really meet people where they are and give them the content that they want and allow them to consume it, you know, particularly with the Wi-Fi platform, which for us is, is relatively unique. We have 1.3 million Wi-Fi hotspots in the footprint, and our Wi-Fi speeds are 15 down, 2 up. So in a lot of cases, like... Sorry, so your Wi-Fi speeds are 15... Down and 2 up. So you can stream video easily if you're at any of our access points, and that comes free with your with your cable subscription. So. If you're out with the wi with the iPad or with your mobile phone, you don't have to use up. Which how many of you have had that experience when your kid watches YouTube on your phone and then you get this the bill the bill yeah so the if, experience. you know our kids like they know we, I don't put cellular on any of their stuff anymore everything is Wi-Fi. Do you keep your is it, you ever seen a bill below two hundred and seventy dollars a month? I'm just curious because I have not. I can't get the bill below two seventy. <laughs> I have just me and it's one hundred and twenty. So and That's then yeah. Good is pretty good but um but the the answer i think for us is yeah. really giving people the content they want in the format yes. they want ideally anywhere they go whether they're home or they're at work or they're you know, not it. while driving but so i have one last question because they've been flashing the out of time so i'll just ask the question so so just just for fun in five years what what does it just all go along the pace is that what the world looks like is it all just more machines 
more screens, more consumption and fluidity with open source, mm -hmm. and any implications that you see to that, either for programmers or for. That's a hell of a subject. <laughs> I mean, I do worry about how to preserve equations like what you have, right? Good quality content wrapped with a great brand. You know, some of it may be more. Um, Specific for an audience, so the I, you know the Portlandias of the world and the rectifies of the yeah. world versus Braxton Family Values or, or Mad Men or you know I, I worry that if the equation continues to go where it's hard for people to fund really good quality programming, that the commoditization of content just continues to to happen. I think that would be unfortunate. Yeah. Um, I'm not really sure yet how the whole YouTube short form. But I, I don't think, and Linda Yaccarino from NBC says this a lot about the advertising piece, I don't think you can replace lots of plays of short form, sort of home, home created content. I don't think that replaces a beautifully <coughs> scripted and wonderfully shot but incredibly expensive piece of long form. But I, I worry about that a little bit. But as far as availability um, of either connectivity or, or video itself, I think that just continues to, yeah. more screens, more places, um, really everywhere, so. Great. Well, thank you so much. We've run out of time. Thank I don't you. want to keep people from what they have to <laughs> thank do. Thanks, Kristen Dolan, for coming. Thank you all for coming out very early in the morning. Much appreciated.